Welcome to the Yet Come On Show podcast. The Yet Come On Show. It's about life, liberty, and the pursuit of show business. That's what we do. Now, whether you're trying to make it in acting or whether you're trying to make it as an entrepreneur, or maybe you're an inventor, or maybe you're somebody who just wants to get a business started, that's what this show's about. But it's also about throwing what we like to say spaghetti at the wall. Does it leave a stain? Lots of stains? Or does it stick? Jeff? Cole, my co-host, for you, it's been interesting. Yeah, it's, it's, it's still a journey. Being the hardest working man trying to get into show business, uh, I've tried everything. He's and done I still all. am. I'm not giving up. He's done all he can. So it's Southside Steve, Jeff Cole, and of course we have a guest. Although, last week, it was all about you and your failures. Well, the, my, my attempts. Not all of them were failures. In fact, our guest today, I would call probably one of my greatest successes, but we'll get to that. But first, I want to say, you know, we're talking about the life, liberty, and pursuit of show business uh, at all levels. Starting out, if you're, you know, kind of starting to kind of get somewhere with it, and if you've gone all the way, okay? So we're going to have the whole spectrum on this show, uh, unsolicited material. We've got one side and the other, and I'm, I'm on your side. I've got two failed businesses, but I tried. <laughs> you tried. That's more But the that's... thing is, you know, anybody that succeeds... Always, I think the one-liner is, I tried one more time. Yeah. Is but, that true? Yeah, no, yeah. yeah uh, the su- su- successful people tried one more time. Yeah. And that's why I'm still doing it, 49. But now, <laughs> what I'm excited about today <laughs> is we have someone, awesome. our guest today, we have someone who has legitimately gone all the way. Nobody helped him. He wasn't born with a silver spoon in his mouth. It might have been a wooden toothpick. <laughs> but he was born in Pittsburgh. <laughs> And uh, I love this guy. This guy is not just a celebrity. He's more of a friend than anything else. When I think of him, and I think you'll agree, I don't think of what he's done or what he's been in. I think of just the individual and the words that come out of his mouth. And I like being in the same room with him. And that's a gift. Most of the time when you meet celebrities, you, you think of just that. You never get close to the person. But I think we know this person. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it, it, that's what I think of, too. I think of the guy that I knew 29 years ago, just r- happened to meet him, and he went on to huge things, yeah. like as big as it gets. Yeah, it is. We now want to introduce to you our guest for this week's podcast, maybe our greatest guest, somebody that Jeff and I would be roommates with if we could. <laughs> that is Billy Gardell. Where you want me, brother? Right here. Right. It's the Johnny Carson setup. <laughs> yeah. It's the Johnny Carson setup. I love it. Jeff has now moved down a seat. I love it. Yeah, well, you, you're Ed McMahon. Yeah, I'm going to be the Ed McMahon. <laughs> He's my Ed McMahon. <laughs> I love it. I it love is. it. Yes. And, of course, I tease you, but I tease you because I wouldn't be in it with Jeff if I didn't think Jeff couldn't take me to the next level. Absolutely. And it's all about timing. It's about good people. Trust. And Trust and, and talent. You do have to have some talent, don't you? Yeah, you got to have talent. Talent keeps you there. Luck gets you there. And luck comes from hard work. Yes. I believe that. I believe that. Well, and we talk what about... What is it? The harder you work, the luckier you get? Somebody said that. Might, might have been Val, Valvano. Uh-huh. Oh, I'll take it. I don't know who said it. <laughs> Claim it. It's yours. No. You got to say it three yours. times for it's yours. <laughs> <laughs> but with Billy, uh, it turns out I met Billy uh, once he was already up and running. He came in on our morning show, uh, mm-hmm. The Regular Guys, and uh, that would have been Rock 100.5. But he came in in 96 Rock Days with Christopher Rood, who gave me my start in radio. I gave Jeff his start in radio. And Billy worked with Jeff, and we're going to go back to those early years. You actually knew Billy before I did. I, I did. Um, and just briefly, he was starting out. You'd been doing comedy for about five years. Yeah. You were 25. Yeah. And you're living in Atlanta. That's right. And I was trying to get up doing open mic nights. And I felt like you kind of were almost mentoring me briefly. Like you were giving me advice. I didn't know that, and I'm sorry. No, no, it was. <laughs> he like, thinks that, though. Is it true? Like I remember one specific one thing that you told me. I used to have a bit about how uh, they can't make a remote control where the battery cover stays on. Right. And I would actually pull out of my pocket right. a bad a, a remote control. Right. You're like, hey man, you don't need the prop. Just, yeah, just, the joke was just, funny on its own. Just just right. hold just hold up like a remote. Yeah, yeah. And that you know because they'll lot, go with you. They'll well, go with. That you. was also yeah. a time when comedians were very against props. Well, you know, I think that I I don't think I was against them. I just think if that's not going to be your whole shtick, you didn't need to pull one. Yeah. Out. You know what I mean? And then like because uh, I remember Carrot Top was the guy back then. Yeah. Like, he popped first, <laughs> and I never understood why guys got so mad at him. I mean, he, it I has, thought it was fun. But he's a sweet guy, and there, it has nothing to do with, with your path. 
So let that dude go. I mean, that's his thing. That's fine. But my point to that was, like, you can do that and take them with you. You didn't need a prop for one joke. Yeah. Like, if you were going to do that, do all of it. But if you but you didn't need to because you are funny without the props. So. What about Gallagher? Why does he get off the hook? The dude was smashing watermelons. <laughs> it worked for him. It that did. was his thing. I, I like what yeah, works Everybody for has you. a different thing, you know? Yeah. Everybody has a little bit yeah. of a different uh, thing. And I think that that's the advice you gave Jeff Cole. Find your way. We got to find your voice. That's what we were talking That's about. Finding your own voice. And the guys back then told me what I told you, which is it takes five years to find your voice, five more before you can write for it. And I always thought <clears throat> back in those times, like you had to come up with this super original, nobody'd seen it before. But the way you do that is you realize that we're all talking about the same thing, but it's you got to make it personal to you. And that's what separates you. And I saw it. You know how I figured that out? I was watching, remember VH1 behind the music? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, one night I'm watching, and they're doing Carlos Santana. And he said, he goes, look, we're all playing the same notes, but it's the way you tune your guitar. You can tell my E from Keith Richards' E. And that kind of unlocked it, because when I was thinking about it with comedy, what, you know, we all talk about relationships, you know, uh, topical events, uh, religion, uh, politics, uh, uh, you know, whatever your critique is of things, drugs, uh, marriage, like it's it's all the same stuff to draw upon. But what makes it personal is your take on it. And I, and I saw that interview and I was like, oh, I just got to learn to tune my guitar. So that's kind of cool. See, now that's way cool. See, that's a good way to look at it. And you're a musician, so you would think, so start tuning your guitar. Well, I am a musician. I can tune. I can play pretty well. Again, <laughs> that's another pursuit of show business that I've kind of tinkered right. with is, is writing songs and producing sure. songs. So but, when we but, do bumpers, Jeff actually plays the guitar. Yeah. And he does for this intro. Oh, I, it's your music on this intro of this show. Nice. I did the theme song. Um, but yeah, that, that advice you gave me back then, I tell people all the time, Billy Gardell gave me the best advice and the worst advice <laughs> simultaneously. <laughs> it was the best advice because you said it takes five years yeah. to find your voice, yeah. which is exactly right. Yeah, totally. And there's no other way around it. Right. And, but it was the worst advice for me because I was 20 years old. And when you're 20 years old, five years seems like an eternity. Yeah, that's like right. asking somebody to wait here for a decade. <laughs> yes. Yeah, like, like, 20, what? what are you talking I'm, I'm ready, totally I'm ready to headline the Fox Theater tomorrow night. <laughs> yeah, so, I totally get that. But, uh, but yeah, it was totally right. And I always remember that. And then, of course... You came down and did a show for me. Mm -hmm. Oh boy! Because we had to do we had to do our own shows right, doing comedy doing in the nineties. Right, right, right. So you came out to this place. How about that? Huh? Wow! <laughs> yeah, man. Look at that. I mean, so Young yeah, I, Atlanta comics. Awesome. Yeah, so I even yeah, so I kind of love that you have the poster. I, I, That's I, fantastic. I kind of I, I I put together this show. I emceed it. That's and awesome. And you came down and and just killed one night That's or crazy, a couple of man. nights, and I was so appreciative of that. That uh, I it's it's been, I've been dying to to kind of express that to I, you I, all this time. Twenty nine years but later. But here's something you should know: when you asked me to come do that show, I was appreciative because now here's another great show I can go do. Whether in that back in those days, it didn't matter whether the show was going to be good or bad. You never knew. The fact you were getting up again, getting up again, yeah. and when an, when another comic says, "Hey." You want to jump on my show? That's a compliment, man, and that 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 should be returned with gratitude. So thank you. All right, because well, that was uh, pretty cool. And thank you were you. the finishing act too, and you did an hour. They you just they hour. just put me up last because I I get up there and start drinking in those days, and you're like, we'll never get him off. <laughs> what was your prop? He said beer. Was beer your prop? I think cigarettes more than anything. Yeah. I was always All smoking right. on. I was like a chimney, and that one of the big panics in my career was when they made this clubs non-smoking. I was like, this no, timing <laughs> off, and then it finally made me quit smoking on stage. So there you go. Good. What the hell? I know, because we have Ron White gets away with cigars, but you're right. Different people have different ways right. and things they do on stage. Sure. I would obviously be a bourbon, but I'd be a mixer. You know, right. and, I, and speaking of that, our sponsor, our <laughs> Right show, into the plug. Uh, Very the, well done. The Yeah, Come On <laughs> Bourbon Whiskey. Smooth? It's sweet and it's smoky, brought to you by Legends Distillery right here in Atlanta, Georgia. There's a great decision in every bottle. Yes, there is. There's a great decision. <laughs> I'm using that. That's fair. Anything else, Billy? That right. was the best advice. That's all There's I got. a good decision in every bottle. I love it. Um, so having you on here and, and having you on this podcast, and again, it is about pursuing what you want to do. Mm. I've heard you say it in an interview, but you've also said it to me. You, like us, all three of us, nobody wanted that that job to report to. You didn't want to have mm -mm. clothes you had to wear. You didn't want to be in a cubicle. You mm -mm. didn't want a nine-to-five lifestyle, no. which is why we're all 
sitting here right now. Right, and I have nothing against any of that if you can do that and you can be successful in that world. I just knew for me that I I wasn't I couldn't fit into that place, man. I just it just not it didn't fit on me. The clothes didn't look right on me. I wasn't comfortable. I wasn't smart enough. Didn't have the I didn't have the that I I'm I'm not a guy that's good at repetitive unless it's something I absolutely love. Then mm. I love being repetitive, like acting. Like I could do that all day because it's all, but it's also something that continually morphs and evolves. But did you Same take acting standard. classes though? Um, I had a great uh, uh, acting teacher in high school that changed my life. So was, you were already doing it in high school. That's, that's how I'm wondering yeah. where it came. Cause well, I, I knew what I wanted to do when I was nine. Wow. And um, and you're from Pittsburgh. Yeah, I originally from Pittsburgh, and, and my dad would watch The Honeymooners with me, and I, I and I was a little chubby kid, and I saw Gleason, and I thought, that's the dude I want to be. I want to be that guy. That's the way I see and you that, a that's, little bit. That's what it sent. And then, and then, it. And then stand up with, with Pryor and Carlin and later Bill Hicks, like watching those guys, and, and then finding out who I was. But the point is... I knew what I wanted to do, and what I didn't realize until I'm 54 now, and I probably didn't realize this until my late 40s, was I thought everybody knew what they wanted to do. But looking back now, I realized that was a real gift because I've got friends my age that still kind of don't know what they want to do. They're still trying to figure it out. So I think one of the gifts and blessings in my life was I knew early this is what I wanted to do. I want to do this. I figured it out at 27. You, I'm, I'm one of those like your friends. I'm still figuring, I'm still out. figuring still it out. Yeah, everything, yeah. Because I've, d- and it's funny. You know, we were talking about the the show that we did 29 years ago. Mm-hmm. That's when I started my day job, which right. I still have. Right. So which is been, impressive. I, which, which is, is good, impressive. But, but that's also kind of like you know, if if you have a backup plan, mm-hmm. you'll take it. Whereas I you, don't know about that anymore. As you get older, you start to think that might have been a little bit of smoke and fire. I don't. I don't. I didn't have a backup plan because there was no black backup plan for me. It wasn't like I chose, like I had terrible grades in high school. I failed 12th grade, had to take another lap. I had, you know, I didn't, I didn't have a path to college and it wasn't really a school for this. So I didn't really have a choice on the no backup plan thing. And when I was younger, it was like, no backup plan or you'll take it. I'm not sure. Maybe it's kind of good to have a spare tire in the trunk. I don't know, but I'm older and I'm more careful now, so I don't know. So I, when, I would say a parachute's always a good thing. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, what the hell? It is good to have that yeah, parachute. I don't think that's a terrible thing these days. But but us, and I, and I know these two gentlemen very well, I came from, you know, I was in a split level with no central air. We didn't get a color TV till I was in the 10th grade. Mm-hmm. So I was, I was wearing the Olympians. Dad said, if you want Nikes, get a job. You pay the extra $12 for that's that right. tennis shoe because this right. shoe's fine. That's right. And that's the way I grew up. So nothing given to us. And that's what I wanted to know in your early age. I don't know about you two, but for me, it was conduct. I sat behind the door in fifth grade. Then the teacher got upset because I brought posters in and I had taped up a little area for me because it was like my office because mm-hmm. I was a conduct mm-hmm. deal. Mm-hmm. Then it gets sent to boarding school. Was it like that for you guys? Is that the reason to failure? It's not because you're stupid because I know you're not. None of us are. But was it conduct? Were I you just, just being I, a stand-up I, in class I, and I a wasn't breakup? really, I, I wasn't, I was sarcastic, but I wasn't really troublesome. But I just knew, like, what was going on then in school, like, just I didn't have any focus for it. And what I've tried to learn as I've gotten older is to be able to focus through the things you don't want to do. That's where success lies. That and being able to fail. You have to be able to fail, get up, and go again. I've been telling my kid that. You got you need a 1,000 failures before you get a success. And he's 20 years old. He's 20. Now. So I said, man, look, that's the deal. But, but I just... It, I don't know, man. Just the straight job just didn't it didn't sound right to me. And you can either embrace that or you can accept that. And that's all about your fortitude. And I was like, I had nothing to lose. Like you said, I grew up in a row house in Pittsburgh, and then we had a you know stepfathers and a crazy life in Florida that wasn't the prettiest. So. All those things. So you had a hot mom? Is that why you had so many stepdads? Uh, yeah, well, my mom was pretty. I, don't, I, wouldn't, I want to call my mom hot. That's kind of creepy. But <laughs> my, <laughs> my thing is, I like all those factors of heartbreak could have been an excuse to do nothing. But I think they drove me out the door to chase my dream. So yeah. I think that's all connected there. But I couldn't see that till I was older. All right. right? That's that's awesome. At what at what point when so you then you started doing stand up in Florida mm-hmm. in the early nineties? Uh, Nineteen eighty seven was my oh first really? Day. Yeah, I was seventeen when I started. Okay, yeah. so, damn, that's early. When yeah. did you up on a stage? Seriously, man, <laughs> I had nothing to say. When did and you, you couldn't drink? <laughs> well, 
<laughs> okay, never mind. It was the eighties. When did you when did you get to where okay, it was the, the hell 80s, with brother. the drinking? Age. It was the eighties. When did you get to where you knew, okay, I'm on the right path, I'm making a living, I'm touring the country, I'm becoming a stand up and I'm finding my voice. I think um I think when I got out on the road as a feature act, back in those days you'd get out first you'd MC your local club and then mm -hmm. a headliner would come by and make a hey, you wanna come open for me somewhere and you'd do these little gigs. And I thought I was a success when I was doing 30 minutes. I had a bar tab, and I was making 150 bucks for the night. I thought, well, Bam. I mean, what else is there? Let's and, get and, married and, and have kids. Yeah, that's it. And then about eight years later, I was ironically at the Punchline in Atlanta and uh, was having a few pops at the bar, and I heard these two comics talking about development deals for television. I was like, what's that? Where do you get that? What TV? And so that started, do that started to drive me towards Los Angeles. But uh, the thing about stand-up is I, I always felt once I did that and didn't have any other job but that, I felt like that was success. Yeah. Like for me at that time. And then, of course, you get older in life and... You know, you get married and you have a kid and there's more responsibility you take on. So it's it's a different kind of success. But for me, the first success in my life was just being paid to just be a stand-up mm -hmm. comic. I thought that was awesome, which led to now I can figure out what I want to say, you know? And then when I, when I see you and you talk about the acting and you take it up a notch. Now, your son only knows you get married, I think, 2001? Yeah, 2000. Yeah. 2000? Two, no, 2001. Yeah. 2001. Yeah. Know, we're, we're, yeah, we're 23. 23. 23 in September. And you have, what, five homes? Uh, no, I got one home, <laughs> and I got a little beach house, a little hideout. Got to have and, a beach but house. I, I Can just, you tell us what coast it's on? It's on the West Coast, but I just sold it, actually. We're just yeah. we're downsizing a little bit, because here's another thing you learn after success, is when you get a lot of stuff, you start thinking, I got too much stuff. You know, I, I used to move a little quicker. Mm -hmm. So me and the wife, now that he's off at of college, we've kind of downsized. Mm -hmm. We're trading in our beach house for uh, for an opportunity to maybe just we're, you know, put that away and go travel a little bit. Nowadays, with uh, with what we want to see at this age, like we want to go to Spain and we want to go to Italy. And so I want to just start doing that stuff. And instead of focusing on one vacation place, I want to go to a bunch of vacation places. So and, that's my next move. Yeah, and you've done the sitcoms. And, you know, like you said, your your son knows you from two great runs, a six-year run and a five-year mm -hmm. run. And, God, your first run with Melissa McCarthy. I mean, phenomenal. 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 And, and, and she, I don't know how many guys tried out for that part. A lot. And I, but I'm I, assuming she focused and said, that's my guy. No, actually, Melissa was, that. Chuck had to fight for Melissa for Mike and Molly. The network wasn't sure. About but, Melissa McCarthy? Yeah, but back then, uh, you know. But I don't know what else she had done at that but point. She had done Gilmore Girls. Okay. But she's such a brilliant talent, and Chuck saw that. That's the one thing. That guy's got a third eye. He just knows what's going to work. And he fought for her to be uh, Molly, and when her and I read, you, like, knew. Like, you just knew, and it's one of those things where you read and you go, oh, my God, mm -hmm. that's it just sounds like it's been happening for 20 years. And y'all were the sensible two. Yeah. You're, you're, you're the two surrounded mm -hmm. in by the middle. crazy people. Exactly. And that was the thing about that cast. There wasn't a weak link in that cast. That, that show's a classic. I feel like Bob Hart's Abishola is a beautiful show. Gina Yashere, who's a comic, really kept it authentic on the Nigerian culture. And then Al Higgins and Chuck Lorre kept it, and Matt Ross kept it uh, in sitcom form with our family, and we blended these things, and we set out a beautiful message that love conquers everything with that show, and I'm so proud of that. And that's kind of the but way it ends, too. It absolutely is. But Mike and Molly, I think, is one of those rare sitcoms that, I mean, that show was taken off the air in 2016, and I think it's still on about 14 times a week. Oh, I, I, I think it. it's a legit classic. Now, I remember at the that. time, I'm telling him, because, you know, there's two people I had crushes on in Hollywood, and I swear if I could have gotten the same Me room, and who else? Well, of course. <laughs> no, you're in my top five. I'm telling you, if I go to the other side, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm coming right. for you. I'll track you down. I don't care if you're in Spain. I will we'll find you. But, because uh, I just love his heart. I would be sleeping with his soul. And this is beautiful. Matter of fact, he's, I think we got a new tat yeah, here, too. I got his little ink on Yeah, there. a little ink. I got, I got mine, too. So, uh, but, but the thing is, I, I had a crush on Jennifer Aniston, which, who didn't? But I really thought I could, I would talk, anybody I interview, whether Kevin Costner or anybody that I got one-on-one -on -one with, I'm like, what's she like? I mean, that would always mm -hmm. be the off thing. Mm -hmm. And he goes, Jenny, no, 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 no. I always thought there was a chance. Mm -hmm. But I had a super crush on your sister-in-law on Mike and Molly. Katie Mixon. 
thought mm-hmm. she was great. A lovely she human being. She's her. a sunbeam, man. And uh, she's a southern girl, which is probably what 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 added to that. But she's a love and a dear. God. And what was hilarious about the part that she played on Mike and Molly, and this is a real testament to how good she is, she is so smart. She's that's what he told me. That's what like, I knew I had no she's, chance. She's not like a burnout <laughs> weed person like she played on the on the show. And it just shows you how good she was at acting. She, and same she's with four delightful. Christmases. She's Del- not like that character. Just super delightful, a great actress and a and a, and a dear friend. A I didn't see I knew she's a friend. Yeah. That's awesome. But then mm-hmm. when he told me he goes, Southside, she's she's really intelligent. She's nothing like what you, you <laughs> no, see. She's super I'm, smart. And I'm like super smart. Okay, I'll scratch that. <laughs> 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 but but you've had two two wives, uh, and you get yeah. the simple names yeah. on screen. You've had two wives. Yeah, man. Um I and yeah, b- between the two It's always Bob. Well, or Bob Mike. and Mike, right? And, and your uh, real name's Billy. But I answered all of them. Like, people will yell, Bob or Billy, How Mike. I answered all. I don't care. I'm grateful. But I figured I got two TV wives and a wife at home who saved my life. So I, I've just learned to listen, I think. <laughs> That's what's happened to me in my life. Yeah, and I want to talk about the obvious. Uh, you know, people, I hear it now, and it's like, friends know the deal. But anytime I come across somebody I haven't seen in a while, they're like, I'm like, I'm not sick. Okay, I'm okay, but I lost forty Dude, pounds. It's always so funny. It, it, it's and so you, funny. That's, and that's the, always what they say. Yeah, there's always I'm my touches in. I miss Billy. That's all right. But there's, uh, there's a little higher. No, there's. Uh, <laughs> you know what's hilarious is 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 yeah. There's all this overwhelming support. Like, hey man, congratulations, you saved your life. And then there's always an internet person it's oh, like yeah. i think you look better heavy mm. well what you like me better when congestive heart failure was on the table <laughs> you, you want like me, me to better die? want me to keep my diabetes for you and, yeah. and then the other one is he's sick he's I sick. hate that he's sick brother goes, i'm sitting okay? i'm sitting in a 42 regular suit and i can fly in a middle seat i'm not sick everything's good it's all gravy but it is know? weird like a shirt that would be tight like i'm in larges and i know you've done the same thing and you remember and i've got clothes i like, still pick do you pick them up and go i'm not gonna fit now no that's what i do I go, yeah. that's not gonna hey it went on you know well, it's exciting i look at my 34s and i've got great <laughs> pants that are 36 <laughs> in the waist and i can't wear any of Dude, them 30 36 used to be my right leg <laughs> you yeah. know, so that, that's that's how. Just, so yeah. you lost a buck seventy. How how heavy were you at the heaviest? I think the heaviest I ever got was three eighty nine. Was that on Mike and Molly? Yeah, the beginning of Mike, first two years of Mike and Molly. And, and was that just because both of y'all just being a, a little overweight, and that was the thing? Oh, I was a lot overweight. Yeah, Melissa but, was a little overweight. But I was Melissa, a lot. I was but a lot. Does she? But both of you now, we now know people can get thin like that. She got healthy first, and I yeah. think she did that through you know uh, exercise and stuff like that and discipline. Um, with me later on, I, I got to the point where I just needed something drastic because i let myself get so big and you know the older you get the harder it is to move and when you're really heavy it's really hard to move so i was at a point where it was too hard to exercise so i had to do something drastic so i got bariatric surgery and uh it'll be three years in july but i i follow the same routine every day and i tell people because people ask me about it heavier people ask me about it and i always say just understand that surgery is not the answer it's the beginning because if you're not willing to do what they ask you to do afterwards and you're going to go it? right back to it. So you still have to change everything. And you it's do. not the easy way out, but it is a big beginning. And if you can look at it like that, I think you can be successful. No, it sounds like your your wife super, super supportive in that situation. She's been incredible. I, I look at where I'm at in my marriage now, and I just can't believe this woman made it through all of it. I, I mean, Y'all have the coolest wives. Anytime you meet oh, a comedian's wife, man, you look at them going. They like, have to be special people. They have, they have to be, to be special, look at Bert special wife. people. She's, he's nude all the time. You know, and, you know, and Bert is a love, man. He's another other guy that's a big giant i think his success is attributed to the fact that he's he just wants people to have fun that's it he just wants that's he's not it. trying to tell you how to think or do and i think people really love it. and he's infectious like bert is that way off stage he's uh, we got the tour together years ago and <clears throat> you I could just imagine. see it you I could you could see it was coming man you could see it was coming but again you need a special woman beside you that can like my wife stood by me through no money no money and a baby Drugs and alcohol, getting sober, and fame. Now, any of those things could have wrecked a marriage, and she's still with me to this day, man. She's a good Georgia girl, too. Good See, Georgia I love girl. I love that. <laughs> uh, so when you look at what we're doing right here, uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of show business, staying healthy and staying healthy of mind is, is part of it. 
And that's, that takes time, though. That's not an overnight switch. That takes time. No, and I want to mention right now that what I want him to start taking is Joe B's, one of my proud sponsors. What's that? Bee pollen. Bee pollen. Bee pollen. Wait. I take two capsules a day on an empty stomach. It is the vitamin for men. Right on. The B is the secret to the circle of life. I got educated. And Joe B's, go to joebees.com. I actually read something about that because I have Get hor- you some bee pollen. I have horrid allergies. And, and, oh, and it was re- bee pollen was the thing they recommended or, or uh, honey grown locally by bees. See now, same same deal because they they just have a. But you a travel, way to do it. so that's not going to well, work so, for no, you. No, so but the, this, this would work because it's a blanket. It's a blanket, it's a blanket. and what it is is that I, I I can't stop sneezing when I. Travel. And the cool thing about Joe Bees, so old. listen to what we're talking about. Sneezing. I know, but this is a sponsor. I'm getting paid, but uh, I also believe we that. love it. Thank you. <laughs> uh, but but no, Joe B's. The thing is, is that nothing's added it's straight from nature. So mm. I got hip to it about eight years ago, and I haven't stopped taking it. But right. that's one of those cool things. But you know, and when, you should wash it down with some. Yeah, come on. And by the way, <laughs> did you ever have mental issues that you would need to see our our other sponsor, which is fantastic? Which is which? Well, I just I just got to mention Dave David Markwell Markwell Therapy. Thank you, Ridgeline Counseling. Uh, David Markwell, go to David Markwell or RidgelineCounseling.com. Because a lot of people, you know, we'll hit this real quick, just the mental stuff. He's been the guy that came on air as a joke for 15 years, but mm-hmm. he stayed with me. And he said you wouldn't believe the high schoolers, the elementary school kids that he's having to see that are just going through issues yeah. with the way the world is now. Yes, of course. You're they, sitting- they feel it's hopeless, and they have no yeah. escape from it. I always say in the 80s, you know, we, we were dealing with crack and AIDS and the Iran Contra, but we were able to get away on the weekend. These kids can't escape this. It's mm. overwhelming for them. And I think, too, now, I think true strength is asking for help. I think weakness is sitting on the bar stool or sitting at home and just griping and thinking that something's going to change. I think the only way out is to be strong enough to say, I don't know how to do this. I'm afraid. Have you ever been through this? Those are the questions that allow you to evolve. So we're going to say pop two capsules in the Bobby. morning. Drink this with <laughs> David Markwell at Ridgeline Counseling. Go to markwelltherapy.com, right? Jeez. Okay, cool. Uh, but bills are paid. No, but these are great advertisers that believe in me the way the people believe in you. And we talked about that on well, our show. I'm not going to put your name on nothing that doesn't work. No. I know you. Thank you. Uh, you thank you. I, yeah, I, I'm like, I'm not going to have anybody hunt me down. <laughs> but, but having you on and your son seeing your success, is it a different ride? Do you handle him the way your father handled you? Because I, I he's growing up in a house with more income I, and he sees his father on the television. More income and, and more emotional tools. My dad was my hero, but he could do what he could do. And I've learned to hopefully do a little better. That's what we hope for our children. But I, I told him when Mike and Molly started and all this, he was still very young. There was a big billboard on Ventura Boulevard, and he's like, Dad, you're famous. And I pulled the car over, and I said, listen to me. i got to have a talk. So i got to tell you this right now, and you need to hold this more importantly than anything else in your life. That is what I do. Who I am is your father. And that has been the cornerstone of our relationship. Chills again. Yeah. Jeff, do you get chills? Mm-hmm. And so much so that he doesn't watch anything I do. <laughs> <laughs> and I've seen it. I've seen it. So this was, uh, you just had your, your, your show in. You, yeah. Y'all know, you did six seasons and five seasons. Is it true? Do you have to get seven seasons to get the big money? Well, no. Back How in, does all that work? Back in the Mike and Molly days, there were huge syndication deals after 100 episodes. Uh-huh. And uh, Bob Hart Sabashola, um just got a small syndication deal. It's about a third of what Mike and Molly did. But that's because nowadays... With streaming services and so many channels, it's a different market. So you're not going to get that big syndication ride where you're going to be on it every day at 5.30 and 11.30. We are, Bob Hartz is going to run uh, from 24 to 27, which is a huge syndication deal by today's standards. But it's about a third of what it used to be just because there's not as many avenues now for um, network television. But I think network's making a little bit of a comeback because... These streamers are realizing, hey, this stuff doesn't work unless we have commercials to pay for it. So they're finally figuring that out. So who knows? She's let's, not on the map yet. No, and, and and I know through just I haven't seen you since, I've, you know, you did Bob Hart's uh, mm-hmm. Abishola. But I know you learned a lot about the culture, the it was food. awesome. And the Nigeria, because awesome. I think you said in one thing, does anybody actually know anybody from Nigeria? I've run behind them at the Peachtree Road Race and seen them mm-hmm. win, mm-hmm. but I don't know know them. Right, right, right. No, it was beautiful to, 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 to learn that culture. And what you find in, in this world, man, if you take the governments out of the equations, you find that people want three things. 
They want someone to love. They want something to eat. And they want something to, somewhere to live. And when you boil that down, then you start to see that this culture has the same respect for their elders as we do in a different way. They have the same work ethic as we do in a different way. And everybody's working for a better life. And what I really loved about the show is with all the hubbub about immigration, yes, there's bad immigration. But there are also great immigration stories where people come to this country and become what they dreamed. And we forget that. That's what we're built on. At some point, somebody in all of our families was hey, on a boat, brother. Yeah. So there are good stories, too, and I'm glad we got to highlight that. I really now, and that's cool. And I think, God, and I'm going to get light because I'm not going to get political. But all I say is if people are trying to come in, all I want them to do is be vetted and make it easier to become a citizen. Well, we just have to fix the system. Yeah, I don't that's know all. that I could pass the test, bro. There you go. I well, don't there, think I could. That's honesty right there. No, I don't that's think honesty. if you gave me the same test <laughs> these people are having to take, I don't think I would pass it. I think if we focus on fixing the, the system— that America becomes the land of opportunity. Again, that's it. I think. And, but and that's what, what this is all about, Just opportunity. Just telling dick jokes on a Friday night. <laughs> no. you know, what I know. But I love getting serious with this because <laughs> Billy, you know, you can see Billy on stage and you get an idea of, of at least what he thinks is funny or your experiences. But, yeah. you know, having this guy in studio over the years and Jeff, the start, you know, you knowing him when he was just a kid. Yeah, brother, we were mm -hmm. Pearl Jam together. <laughs> yeah. Headshot. Jeff had long hair. Now I got the long hair. Uh, highlighted, by the way, I just want to make sure that's because I am seventy percent gray. A little more honesty, uh, but you know, I can't, I can't go there because it's all about perception. Just like you got healthy, if you're going to play this game in the public eye, you got to have something working for you. I just think if you stay in the place of service and kindness, you don't put people off, and you're able to communicate. And if you share experience instead of opinion, stay out of trouble. Yeah, experience speaks for itself. Do you want to talk about any of your homosexual experiences? Anything you've been doing? I'm just kidding. <laughs> he now, Jeff, Jeff's some, on his fourth marriage. You he had to get some south side humor I in saw there. That. I, it's just a little bit. But you know what Billy did to me one time, and I'm not going to get into it. I, I said one thing, and Billy goes, you didn't have to say that. That's not who you are. Don't do that. And that's the lesson you taught me. And I wanted to get towards the end of the podcast to tell you that. Mm. doesn't matter what the subject was, but you said it to me. You said south side. You said, you're better than that. You're better than that. Don't We're do all that. better than that and, if and we it, choose to be. And it changed my humor line, not going because when you're second no, you, seat, you're not a mean guy. I'm not. You're a likable I'm a dude. Guy. I'm and a I love. and I've I've embraced that too. And I feel the same way, man. I, I don't look if you're walking around yelling at people, you have made some bad choices. <laughs> you made some bad choices. She's done some dumb stuff. Yeah. What can we look forward to at the punchline now that you have a resurgence in your? Well, I got career? I got some new stuff that I'm doing that I'm really enjoying about my weight loss and about being an empty nester at home with you know the kid gone. And then I'm going to do some greatest hits because uh, what I'm going to do is because I'm this size now. All that stuff was when I was bigger. So what I want to do is I'm going to hire one of these social media kids. I'm going to embrace the Internet. Oh, damn. And I'm going to put some of my older stuff out so they can see me, but see me in so the material matches the body because I don't want to put out me being big in that material, but like, who, who who's this yeah, guy? Yeah. So I want to connect the two. I'm, so it's kind of a fun project for me to get my greatest hits out and then work on a new hour while I'm doing that. And it's I've just kind of re- Refound a passion for stand up, and so why why not come back to Atlanta and where it started? Runs. <laughs> and know? the TV runs and the movies, because like you were following his career, you've done some acting. Been very as well. lucky. Yeah, I, I think the first thing I saw you in was that episode of Desperate Housewives. Ah, that's right. I was like, what's Billy Gardell? <laughs> yeah, I couldn't believe. You know how I got that part? Uh, it was for a detective who's bugging uh, Eva Longoria's house, and to cover at the <laughs> end of the scene, he has to fall on the bed and kiss her. And when I went into that audition, it was every hunky muscle guy uh, in, you know, just 20 beautiful men right. that were in perfect <laughs> shape. And then my little chubby ass come walking. Hey, how you doing? Is this where the audition is? I'm here. But what was weird was this is why you got to follow everything. It was such an odd choice that the producers were like, we got to give it to this guy. This dude. Oh. And so, like, and I walked out of there laughing at the muscle guys out there. I was like, ha! See what happens. <laughs> but it was just because, you know, just you don't know. You don't know. So you got to keep trying, keep trying. And that, that was one of those. How many ones. takes to get your scene? Uh, three. I think it took me three. That's not bad. Yeah. I always like to be, I don't like to be the guy that holds things up. I like to be prepared. Uh, give me a, uh, if you can give me some auditioning advice, because you've auditioned before you got to where you are yes. for big parts. Yes. I, I don't even remember you talking about that in 95. You mm. were starting to get in I the room. I was starting to get in the room, yeah. 
when you go in as an actor, because I still audition for stuff, mm -hmm. I mean, is it important for you to make a choice? Like, hey, I'm going to commit you to one thing. You should have your choice of what you're going to do before you walk in there. But the most important thing to remember before a big audition, whether it's on tape, whether it's on, because nowadays most of it's self-taped and sent in, whether it's in front of producers, directors, I, the one thing you got to remember is they can't take anything from you. So don't let those nerves play your best game because you're if you're going in there with seven bucks in your pocket and you don't get it, you're still leaving with seven bucks. But there's a chance that it could become something more. So go embrace that and play into that and have fun and let it all hang out. That's the thing. Don't worry yourself out of success. And think about tell me about the new tat, I gotta ask. What those are these are old. Like, this one's about, well, why does this, it look so beautiful? Well because of moisturize. <laughs> That's uh, that one's uh, about fifteen, and that one's about ten. I got those in Hawaii. This was for my ten year anniversary. That was for my fifteenth. My it. wife and I got married in Hawaii. It's a very special place for us. So, I, I go back every we go back every five years just to to, to retouch that beginning of what we were. Do you and, think you'll always live on the West Coast? I, I love California, man. The weather's awesome, <laughs> dude. It's hard to beat. I mean, we have our problems like everybody else. We got taxes and we got some stuff, but look, nowhere is free. Nowhere, nowhere doesn't have. It I don't stuff. have to worry about my Billy falling in the ocean. Nah, I'm not good. too close. I, get, I, I think maybe, maybe after I see my son get going, and maybe hope, God willing, his career takes off. We're all not. And then I don't know, maybe ten years, me and the wife will look at somewhere. Uh, Maybe a little more spacious, like maybe a little more, a little more land, mm -hmm. you know. Because California, you buy your land, and you're right mm -hmm. next to somebody, but and you pay. You know what you get here with that money? I do. And would you like a circle well, driveway? Well, she's, and, and a four she, car garage? she's also a Georgia girl, so I don't think a lake house would be out of the question. But we'll see. I don't know. I'm open to all of it. Like I said, I'm open to wherever the path goes. I hate to know? say it, and your 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 long term uh, uh, long time manager, Chris Pet, is just mm -hmm. off camera sitting here uh, in what we call the green room. Couch. Well, he thinks we're getting paid. That's why he came down uh, here. Is that why? <laughs> Damn, Chris! Chris also part owner of the Punchline with Jamie Bindle. Uh, but yeah, I, I look at. You know what you've done and what he's done for yeah. you and everything, but I'd love to have you here. And if you were, damn, if I wouldn't want to come by every once in a while, just well, say, hey. I think we'd do that in a minute if I was in Georgia. And me and this guy, we've been together, like I told you on the on the radio show, but thirty years on a handshake. Like he's the godfather of my son. Awesome. And we've been together. It's so much deeper than business, and it's like you know we literally have. He has a picture on his desk of when his son, his son was three. I have him on my shoulders. And I have a picture next to it of his son when my son was three on his shoulders. So that's how long this has all been going on. Damn. Wow. George has been pretty good to me. It right? has. Yeah. I know really my has. wife even came by and I wanted to get the kids. I wanted a picture of you holding they my just kids wanted, and they, they freaked wanted out. a snack, bro. They, they just, just wanted, wanted a snack. snack. <laughs> so I'm like, all right, honey, I, I know that you're not showered, but let's get a picture. That's so great. You know, man. but it's great. I'm going to show you one so thing. Good. I wasn't going to get you up, Chris. All right. And we'll close out with this. Jeff, you got anything you want to say to this big man in, in closing? Uh, Love. Man, what, that, what, when we talk about life, liberty, and the pursuit of show business, I will say one of the highlights, as small as you may think it is, was when you came down into that uh, show for me. You're a gentleman, Jeff. Thank and, you. And I, I really Thank appreciate you, it, and I, and I never forgot I needed it. the gig, man. No, hey, yeah, I didn't pay you. I think you got it. doesn't you got, matter. You needed the time. You, needed, you didn't pay him? He got a couple we of were, I don't think anybody. No one I got, got free booze that night. Yeah, no, it was no great. Got, no, no one got paid. And now you're good booze. and you can't drink my booze, so we're going to give it to your manager, I Chris think that's right. That'll go to a good cause right there. Uh, hopefully right. this will be in Punchline soon. I'm there pushing out with Chris. <laughs> what uh, do you got? The original shirt. The greatest. That's so great. great. That's I, so great. And, and this this is a gift for you. Uh, yeah, Thank come you, on. I kept the sticker so you know it was brand new. I got it. Go to uh, yetcomeon.com. Yeah, come on. Yeah, come on. <laughs> yeah, come on. <laughs> but this smoking the bandit is authentic, and you can tell the thing, and I still can fit into it. That's so great. But when we met, there's nobody that does, and you talked about it earlier, Buford T. <laughs> Justice. <laughs> yeah, man. You he, do he, him he, so he was well. our guy. Nobody chasing me, boy. <laughs> yeah, he was the great. He was the guy. <laughs> Anytime Gleason came on TV when I was a kid, as a chubby kid, I thought, it, that's who I want to be. That I want to be able to do that. I want to be able to walk in a room and light people up. But the thing I love most about Gleason, and I think what made him so spectacular, especially with the Honeymooners, was his ability to be genuine and to apologize when he's made a mistake. And you saw the humility in him, which allowed you to enjoy all his craziness. And I thought, this guy can do everything. And then when you saw him in The Hustler, you were like, oh legit dramatic mm -hmm. actor to do it and then i think his last movie uh, nothing in common with tom hanks was probably his best work 
and what a beautiful end to a beautiful career. I'll tell you my favorite Gleason quote. In 1987, when he was very sick and he was in his home in Miami and they had him in a hospital, but he's smoking in the hospital bed. Why not? Well, you know he's in. Why not? So, so he's sitting there and they're talking to him about his acting process. And they said, what's your acting process? And he goes, process. They yell action, I pretend. They yell cut, I get a cup of coffee. And I thought, I'm taking that philosophy. <laughs> I'm not going to take myself too seriously. And, and I don't take myself seriously, and I don't yeah, come on. either. Yeah, come on. It has been one absolute pleasure having you on this Thank podcast. You guys. And Thank it's all you, man. And, and our tagline is uh, un- unsolicited material. Thank you. I always I get Jeff it. to mention that. So you don't have to worry about that anymore because people ask you, hey, do you want to do, do, you want to do that? <laughs> I'm still having to send stuff out unsolicited. Keep sending it, man. I'm, the I'm only not, thing I'm, I did right was I didn't quit. Yep. There don't you go. quit. That's there you it. go. It's always one more time. Uh, this was a great time. It's been a pleasure. It is the Yet yeah, Come On Show with Billy Gardell. Can I get a Yet yeah, Come On? Yeah, come on. <laughs> <laughs>